Welcome to Season 2 of Rush of Fear Podcast, where we chat all things Halloween Horror Nights, Universal Orlando's premier scare event. Tonight, for Episode 8, we'll be talking all about the latest Halloween Horror Nights 31 house announcement. So, let the mayhem begin. What a rush of fear. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, to Rush of Fear. It's so good to have you. We're here hanging out. I'm here by myself uh, again, just like I was on the uh, reaction episode for uh, Legends Collide, I want to say. Um, but you know what? We're going to have a good time anyway, because I've got a clip from Maddie with her reaction. And I have a nice treat for everyone once I'm done with this solo portion of the show. But you know what? I'm not going to like waste your time. We're going to get right to the fun stuff. I'm Kenneth, by the way, if you didn't know that, if you're listening to the first time, uh, well, thanks for being here. Anyway, so this is very fun. This is very fun because we got a new house announcement pretty soon after the last one, I got to say. Feels like the last one was very recent. Um, so yes, the Horrors of Blum House announced for the uh, house lineup. I believe on both coasts as well. I think this is in Orlando and on Hollywood. So that's pretty fun. Uh, this is, of course, the third house uh, that we've had in the Horrors of Blumhouse series. The first one in 2017 included the movies Sinister, The Purge, and Insidious The Last Key, which was like a pre-release almost like a trailer for that movie because the movie didn't come out until after the event was over. Interesting choice there. And then the following year, I believe, we had The Horrors of Blumhouse Part 2, which included Happy Death Day and uh, The First Purge. So that was a two, like a double feature house. Um, And, you know, we'll be frank, these houses don't necessarily have the best uh, reputation in the Horror Nights community. Um, but I think this one might have a chance at having a better better reception. Because what we've got... Well, let me just read what uh, what the Horror Nights website says about the house. So on the announcement little page for this house, on the Halloween Horror Nights website, we've got the Horrors of Blumhouse. Step inside a new double feature of Blumhouse Horror. Your scream squad will find yourselves trapped between a frantic teen and the ruthless serial killer she swapped bodies with in Freaky. Then you'll try to make a desperate escape from the dark basement of the Grabber before you become his latest victim in the terrifying The Black Phone. So yes, I do think uh, that this is going to be a pretty good time. I just watched the movie Freaky for the first time after this announcement. I got to say, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I was a fan of the film Happy Death Day as well, um, but I can understand where some people wouldn't like that uh, house, that movie as a house because of the repetitive nature of the you know, the premise of the movie, it just is what it is. So I thought it, they did a good job with that movie, but I understand why there were people who didn't like it. Um, but this one, on the other hand, I think that the, uh, at least freaky, I haven't seen the black phone, of course, because it's, you know, new release at the time of this, uh, re- episode release. I think the movie just came out today. So I haven't gotten a chance to see it, but people seem to be really excited about it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the next segment afterwards. But before we do that, I know that we do have a clip from Maddie. Uh, Maddie did send in her reaction. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and uh, send it over to her. Maddie, fill us in. How's your reaction here on the uh, this episode or this? Um, why can't I talk? <laughs> Being here by myself is hard. <laughs> Maddie, what's your reaction? Fill us in. Over to you, Maddie. Hi, guys. Sorry I could not be a part of the podcast recording tonight. Uh, Horror Nights loves to announce things while I am not in town or available. So Kenneth is doing our lovely reaction uh, episode tonight. Um, 
thrilled to listen to it once it is all done. Uh, as far as our announcement for today, I'm pretty excited. Um, I haven't gone to see Black Film yet since it did just come out, but I do have tickets already to go see it on Thursday, so that will definitely um, determine whether I'm actually excited for the house or if it's going to be an interesting one. Um, I also need to watch Freaky. Uh, it's not one that I've watched yet. I've heard good things. The synopsis sounds pretty interesting. So I guess once I watch that, once again, I will make uh, a decision on if I'm excited for the house. Um, excited to see Blumhouse back. I really hope that they kind of redeem themselves. I didn't it wasn't my favorite house, the last Blumhouse horror is a Blumhouse that we had with uh, Purge and Happy Death Day. Um, but I'm excited for two new properties, excited for some more IPs coming in. Um, as always, you know, Blumhouse does do really, really good things. So super excited for that. And yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have a lot to say just because I haven't seen the movies yet. But I am excited for it. The video um, for the announcement was super, super cool. I really enjoyed it. Um, bringing in, you know, more characters, the clingy couple. Um, Brock, the person on the phone, I'm pretty sure was the character uh, that we saw in the first announcement. Um first announcement video, The Snacker, I think. Uh, it would make sense. Um, but yeah, super excited. Um, super pumped for another announcement. Hopefully they're going to be coming at a more rapid pace now just because we are inching closer and closer to the start of the event. But yeah, all right. Enjoy the rest of the episode, guys. Kenneth, I'll chat with you later. Um, and yeah, bye. Awesome. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you for joining us from afar on this episode. Uh, and you know what? Maddie made some good points about the announcement video, um, which is, you know what? Our next topic of conversation right now. So the announcement video was really good. If you haven't seen it, go find it on social media or on YouTube, wherever, um, because it's great. It's got the, yeah, the clingy couple, as Maddie said, um, they are walking through a parking garage, through uh, the City Walk parking garage. It looks like they're in the Jurassic Park section of the garage. Um, and they're on their way to an elevator. And then the uh, the lady in the couple, she uh, gets a phone call from a character named Brock, which I do agree with Maddie. I do think that is the snacker from the Legends Collide announcement video. Uh, they get a call from him and... They start running because uh, who's behind them but Millie being possessed by the butcher from Freaky. And then they run to the elevator and the elevator opens and inside is the grabber, I, I suppose, from the black phone. So it's a, you know, has really good energy. It's shot really well. It was pretty exciting. I do think it's um, more fun, more exciting than the Halloween um Halloween announcement video, which I think if these are all connected, which is looking more and more like they're kind of building a big, you know, shared universe of announcement videos, uh, it, it seems like the Halloween announcement video is a quieter uh, moment, you know, in the action. So this one definitely kept the energy up a lot higher. I do love the production value of all of these announcement videos. And uh, yeah, these are these are coming out great. I gotta say the uh, the team that is working on these and putting these together is uh, knocking it out of the park. It's a really new take, really interesting take for these types of announcement videos. Very different from what we saw for like HHN twenty eight, um, which is the last time I can remember where like even the originals all got their own announcement video, but it was all just like you know. Uh, it, it kind of looked like just like stock footage that you could download from from like a website uh, and just put together to use for whatever you want, which I mean, it was effective and they were cool. But I think this this approach is uh, much more effective and more, more fun. 
um, to see what, you know, what's the next thing that's going to happen, who's the next character we're going to meet, what's going to, you know, it's not just the house that's being announced that we're looking forward to. Now it's also, okay, let's see what the new video adds on to this building uh, cast of characters that we've got in our <laughs> commercials. So this is a, it's a, it's, I've never seen anything like this before for anything. So it's, it is pretty fun, pretty exciting. And of course, as we've had for every announcement so far this season, there was also a merch drop. Uh, as always, they're available in the Five and Dime, which is at the exit of the Born Stuntacular and the Universal Orlando uh, Horror Makeup Show. And also, I believe, over in the uh, Halloween Boutique in the Lost Continent area of Islands of Adventure. And it's a shirt, like always, a t-shirt and a Christmas ornament with the logo for this house, which is the two villain characters um, kind of, you know, upside down. Like one's right side up and one's upside down, I believe. Or maybe one is facing on the left and the other's on the right. I'm not, I don't have it pulled up in front of me. Let me go look. Let me go look. Yes. So it has um, the grabber right side up and the butcher upside down with the logo of the horrors of Blumhouse right there in the middle. And the same design is on the Christmas ornament. So those are available. It's, you know, that's actually a pretty nice shirt. I don't know that I would, be, I'm going to wear it. I'm going to, I don't know that I'm going to buy it. I have to be more selective. I have too many t-shirts, everyone. I had to like throw away so many, or not throw away, but set, take to Goodwill, like so many t-shirts that I have just because I have too many of them. My drawers won't close anymore. So I do have to be selective on uh, which shirts I buy from Horror Nights now. I don't think I can buy my usual like seven or eight shirts every year. Uh, I just don't have the space for them anymore. Um, but the Christmas ornaments, I, I do kind of want to go see if they're all still available or do they completely remove them from the shelves when the new one comes out. I know Maddie last time said that all of the ornaments were still available last time she went to look. I haven't gone to do that, but if I can still get all of them, I kind of now I want all of them so I can have a nice little Horror Nights tree um, around the holidays, you know, keep the spook alive all year. Spookiness is not a, it's, it, it lives in your heart all year. It's not when the calendar says it's already Halloween now and it's June. You know what I mean? So anyway, Yes, that is it for the announcement as far as all the new stuff we got, all the new stuff we learned. Uh, but this episode isn't over yet. It's not. Not even close. How dare you think such a thing? Uh, no, uh, because I actually got to talk. I got a message on my on my phone from one nice guest who uh, who said he had some information that he had in his head that needed to get out somewhere. And so I invited him onto the show. I'm going to go over to our conversation now. I have an interview with Mr. Mark Kleinhens, uh, who you may know his writing from previous uh, various theme park websites and even movie websites. So he has a lot of knowledge on this type of thing. Um, I think he did a similar interview like this on Grim Grinning Hosts recently for the new season of Stranger Things. And so uh, he has graced our show now. So... You know what? I'm going to kick it over to my interview with Mark Kleinhens right now. So, yeah, here we go. And we are back. This is very unusual for me because... I'm here with a guest. You've already gotten the the intros out. I've we've talked about what the new announcement was, what the movies were, and that's all out of the way. Loved that new trailer. That was great. But now we're here with a guest. This is something unusual. Hopefully it won't be the last time. Uh but yes, I'm here with a guest. He reached out to me and said, "Hey, I know a lot about these two things." So uh, if you need any research or information, and I said, do you just want to come on and talk about it yourself? So here he is. You may recognize his name from writing on various theme park uh, websites and publications and otherwise uh, movie stuff, I think, pop culture nerd stuff in general. You know his name. His name is Mark Kleinhens, and he's with me here. Hello, Mark. No one knows my name, but thank you. I appreciate that. I it knew feel- your name. <laughs> it makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> People who listen to this might know your name, you know, people in this, in these circles. All, all three of the, of our crossover listeners. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's up, Mark? How are you? 
Oh, long day. Uh, my voice is very hoarse from lots of phone calls and meetings today, so you have to forgive me for that. Otherwise, excited. I don't know too terribly much. I'm afraid I lied to you just to get oh, no. the podcast. What a but, scam. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a part of the whole horror vibe, right? I'm the con yeah. man who gets his foot <laughs> in the door. I am excited. You and I have very different views. I, I've come to realize recently on the horrors of Blumhouse and the, the previous houses at Halloween Horror Nights Orlando. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to get into it with you. Okay. You're in the mainstream of opinion where you find them not very good? Uh, for the most part, yes. I would say that's a fair assessment. Okay. I wouldn't like argue too hard against that, except for on, I did think the second house was good. Like no qualifiers. I thought that house was good. The first one definitely had its problems. Um, with like the whole, you know, purge turnover, turning it from something else into the purge. That was, you know, it's always a shame when you have to see that, but I, you know, that's a separate issue. <laughs> And also that first house from 2017 had the three different properties in one. And if memory serves correctly, the first two entries were only a couple of rooms each. And then the last one was Insidious, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and Insidious, one, the last key. Yeah, and that was a lot longer. And I think also not to, because we agreed not to talk about uh, Hollywood, but yeah. <laughs> when you take a step <laughs> and look at Hollywood and Orlando both, they have this very interesting tendency to try and include movies that are either just coming out or are going to come out towards the very end of the uh, events run. No, obviously this movie comes out, uh, what this week? Yeah, this week, uh, uh the black phone. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I shouldn't say this movie, right? I should specify the black. Phone. <laughs> um, and so that gives, they guess, um, guests about two months or so to kind of go out and get it. And with the kind of how pan, um, excuse me, how COVID, the pandemic, has uh, kind of mixed up Hollywood and film distribution strategies and everything else. Uh, God only knows how long, if I'm not mistaken, Universal and Blumhouse have this uh, deal from a few years ago that there only needs to be 17 days after the theatrical debut before Universal can bring these movies to some kind of streaming service or another. So I'm sure by the time uh, Halloween Horror Nights starts this year, guests will have the chance to kind of dig into it and see what the black phone's all about. Ah. But uh, I still find it very interesting that they're they're so universal or art and design or Blumhouse or someone somewhere is so interested in having these things almost definitely serve as some type of marketing. Uh, I wouldn't say marketing ploy, but marketing springboard, I guess, is what they probably hope they are. Yeah, it's the ultimate trailer for a movie that you actually get to walk through and experience. I know that was the idea with the uh, Insidious, The Last Key, which felt like, yeah, it did feel like half of that house was was a movie that hadn't come out yet and wouldn't come out until January, the you know, following the event. Um, and this one, I think the timing f feels pretty good to me for it to come out now and we have until, you know, a Halloween to have seen it. I feel like that's pretty good um, as far as giving people enough time to see it before they go to the event. But it definitely does feel like, hey, we announced this today. This movie comes out tomorrow. So you better go see it. You know, t ticket sales uh, guaranteed right there. You know, at least all these Horror Nights <laughs> fans are going to go see this movie. So there's a little bit of a guarantee for, you know, box office numbers. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder how much of a bump it will get. I'm sure you're right. There, it will be some kind of bump. I know that I went out and I bought the short story collection that the Black Phone first appeared in by Joe Hill, who is, of course, Stephen King's son. Um, I will see the movie eventually. I have a newborn at home who you will probably hear occasionally crying. She's not going to sleep tonight. Uh, so okay. that means because of her, I try not to go out to movie theaters for hours on end just because sure. of sickness and everything else. But uh, eventually, I'm sure I will see it. And if I do manage to get down to Halloween Horror Nights this year, which I'm really, really hopeful I can, I'll be uh, well versed in everything Black Phone. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, you I'm, you mentioned um, a, a few things that I had never heard before, but I know that you did want to get a little bit into some context with Blumhouse before we dug into each of the movies that are part of this house. So uh, what, what what do we need to know about Blumhouse overall? Are we talking about the studio or the the history of the houses at the event or what are we what are we uh, uh, enlighten us? <laughs> let's do everything. Let's OK. Let's, three hour podcast. Let's go. All um, right. 
I think the production studio itself is very interesting. It got incorporated in 2000 in 2014. Jason Blumhouse, the guy who runs it. Jason Blum. Sorry, I always do that. Jason Blum, <laughs> the guy who runs Blumhouse, the house of Blum, if you will. Uh, yeah. He signed a, a first look deal with Universal Pictures. And so I'm I was trying to find uh, dig into the news today. Not that I had much time to. Uh, to see if they had extended that first look deal past 2024. Because uh, most recently, uh, somewhat recently, I guess, is, you know, the COVID has completely messed up my frame of reference and time and everything's a flat circle. So forgive yeah. me. Yeah, that's yeah, fair. I'm, I'm Relatable. Sure you, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Blumhouse, they've managed to get their hands not only into the Halloween franchise, but also into what Universal had tried to make into the dark universe, the the rebirth, if you will, of the Universal oh, of Monsters. Course. Right. So the fact that he's doing that and he seems to be getting more and more into bed with Universal makes me think that 2024 will not be the end of their partnership, that they'll continue to have that kind of exclusivity, which makes me think that this will not be the last time that we see a Blumhouse haunted house at you know, at uh, Halloween Horror Nights. Yeah. And it especially makes sense if you are art and design or you're, you know, Universal Parks and Resorts and... Universal Pictures has this great relationship with a horror studio that does well uh, repeatedly and consistently, and you need new uh, intellectual property because you're running out of the classics. We're repeating Halloween uh, for the first time this year, Uh, so you need those new modern ones, and if you've already got this great relationship with Blumhouse, which I don't think is actually owned by Universal, but it feels like it might as well be at this point. Um, Yeah, right. It, you know... That's it's a perfect relationship to have there, and so I agree that even if we don't have more houses that are branded as Blumhouse per se, we would definitely still keep seeing Blumhouse movies represented in houses and scare zones in the future. Yeah, I think that's a very fair assessment, actually. Um, all right. So, 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 and yeah, when you wait. say first look deal, that or that means that they have these uh screenplays but universal has like exclusive access to pass on them before they go to other studios is that the idea yeah exactly so jason blum puts together a package or he has a script or maybe he already has the financing or whatever the case may be he has these films and he goes hey or tv shows now he's gotten to television in the last few years as well oh cool and he says hey uh universal do you want to do this or not and then it looks like universal usually says yes and just to back up for a second to kind of more fully answer your question um Blumhouse. So Jason Blum has this this golden rule, and that is you only spend X number of dollars on a movie, and that's it. You don't ever change it. If the director comes to you and says, "Hey, you know, we filmed this during principal photography, and it's just it's not working that well. I want I want an extra, you know, five hundred thousand or a million dollars to go back and refilm the ending, or whatever the case may be." Something which Disney has really gotten into, like with Rogue One, a Star Wars story, and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Jason would say to you, "No." That breaks the that violates the golden rule. It's you only spend so much money and then you release it. And then the amount of money that you spend, they call it the term that the, the trades always use is micro budgets. It's like up to three million dollars. I think that's an ever shifting kind of definition, but it's a micro budgeted movie. It's very little money. Then you market it a certain way. A lot of these are horror films and horror fans. I, I was just talking to my wife the other day. Um, and I was trying to explain to her like, Horror is basically maybe horror and like who done it. I just watched Knives Out for the first time. Oh, it's like, so great! Yeah, it's it's fantastic. I can't believe Netflix paid almost half a billion dollars for the exclusive rights to the two sequels. But that's a whole different. Uh, oh wow, I didn't even know that. That's insane. Yeah, maybe uh, we should somehow convince Universal to get Knives Out as a haunted house so we can get on here <laughs> and do a podcast and chat about that. <laughs> uh, what was the point of this whole diatribe? I forget. Um, oh yes, mysteries and horror movies. The, the micro budgets. Two. <laughs> yeah, the, the only two genres left, basically, where you, you can get away with a modern movie audience paying X number of dollars to go to the movie theater or to stream it premium on video on at home, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I feel like those. <gasps> oh, all right. We'll take a moment here. Pardon the interruption. Uh, dogs bark. You know, it happens. But we are back. So, Mark, you were talking about um, uh, how horror and mystery movies are still the only two that can get away with having such a small budget and still getting a pretty big 
uh, audience to come out and see it, right? Yeah, and the box office returns they get aren't, you know, compared to like a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, they're probably only like a third of what an Avengers film makes, or God, for Avengers specifically, it's probably like a tenth. Yeah. But you don't need to make that much money because when you have such a small budget to begin with, generally speaking, you need to, you need to make about three times your, your production budget in order to start to get a profit. And that can vary depending upon how much marketing you have and all these other costs that might be associated with your movie. But these movies that Blumhouse started to put out, they they really made it into like this mass production, almost like a McDonald's cheeseburger. You know, it's it's the it, no matter what it is, like they can they can pump it out, and it's pretty much the same box office return. Not everything can be a paranormal activity, but man, they really they really kind of codified this in a way. And I don't know if they've had as much success in television. That's a lot murkier for me to track. I would but, I would say I would think not because I didn't even know that they did TV. So um oh. like what's what what's a show that they do uh the first well the only one that i ever watched uh, you're putting me on the spot here my my nerd bona fides are <laughs> i'm <indie>. sorry <laughs> um i think this was the first one it probably wasn't because that's the other thing about blumhouse they always have their hands in something that you had no idea they were behind uh is the purge the lasted for two seasons on oh USA. sure of course uh, I never ended up watching the second season, unfortunately. I need to still, but uh, I have lots of late nights with the newborn. She doesn't mind watching stuff like Freaky or stuff like eventually <laughs> Black Phone. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll have to do The Purge too. Anyway, um, to have that as their kind of production mentality and how they move forward, and that's how they've gotten to be so successful and then put on the map and to have this this deal with Universal Pictures and have this big presence with Universal Parks and Resorts. I just find that all that very, very interesting. And um, even if this current Horrors of Blumhouse maze isn't necessarily um, up to snuff or up to the snuff of the other haunted houses this year at HHN, Maybe at the very least, uh, having that little tidbit of contextual info might help you appreciate what we do get in these in this house a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Um, and I mean, just to add a little bit onto that, I mean that it, it's cool that Blumhouse is able to make its success on that micro budget um, kind of philosophy, because I believe that the slasher film, one of the original successes of the slasher film in like the 80s was that you could make them very cheap and then you know you'd get hits like friday the 13th and and nightmare on elm street and you know i think halloween is probably looks like it would have been pretty inexpensive to make um Mm -hmm. so that's always been one of the big draws of slashers in particular i'm sure now you've got like bigger budget more like supernatural horror movies that might be a little bit more expensive um and then also Oh, do I remember what my also was? I don't think so. Oh, well. <laughs> that seen all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I had something right there. <laughs> It'll come back later. Yeah, I will. I'll interrupt you. I'll be like, I remember. That's um, <laughs> I'm used to it. My wife does it. <laughs> um, so so it, let, let's get into these two then. Um, these two movies that were announced for this house, uh, which are Freaky and The Black Phone. Um, you said you watched Freaky a month ago. I just watched it literally like 10 minutes before we started this <laughs> call. So it's fresh in my mind. I really liked the movie a lot. Um, but what do you what do you know about it that might be helpful for for guests to Horror Nights uh, and listeners of this show? So you have to forgive me for this one, too, because <laughs> usually I get full nerd, you know, like, oh, I got to know who the director is and the writer. And it, when it yeah. came time to watch it, I'm just like, ah, I'm just going to watch it. You know, I think we'll blame the newborn. Right. Like, I don't have the time to do such niceties as research. So it really surprised me when I looked back and I found out Christopher Landon, who's the director. Well, first of all, he's the son of Michael Landon from Little House in the Prairie, which I had no idea. Oh, OK. That's really interesting. And then secondly, <laughs> he's the same guy who wrote and directed Happy Death Day and the sequel, which in retrospect makes perfect sense. I think there's yes. a lot of overlap between these movies. And then speaking of Blumhouse and Paranormal Activity, he is a longtime writer and occasional director of that franchise, starting with the second one forward. Hmm. So um, that's a franchise I really fell in love with. I'm a huge found footage nerd. I, I just I, I adore those things. I, I stalked the original Blair Witch Project filmmakers. I'm buddies with at least one of them now, which I'm sure he uh, he regrets ever <laughs> answering the phone, my phone call. Um, excuse me. But I love found footage. I love paranormal activity, even though um, 
I think sequelitis is probably a fair term to use for that franchise. And again, mm-hmm. you can see like with the Purge TV show, I never ended up watching the last one or two entries, but uh, he has a very, this director, Christopher Landon, I think has a very interesting approach, especially when it comes to comedy and horror. And I know I just heard you say off the air, Kenneth, that you really liked, um, it's not Happy Death Day. What is this movie? Oh my freaky. God. Freaky. Freaky. Thank you. What a freaky day I've had. <laughs> you really <laughs> freaky like Freaky Thursday. Yeah. I, the movie wasn't for me. This is okay. not, this movie was not written for me. It was not directed for me. It was not produced for me. Um, I actually happened across a review earlier today where the person said with happy death day, uh, Christopher Landon tried to do uh, groundhog's day, but with a little bit of a horror twist. And then he kind of did that to death with a rushed sequel. So then he ended up going to freaky Friday and trying to do that with a horror twist. So that was not a very nice review. Um, I have to say, Okay, but yeah, uh, it's just, it's not for me. I don't like, comedy that much in general i'm a very boring intense individual <laughs> uh, i definitely don't like horror comedies at all it's that's just it just completely turns me off and then at the same time i feel like maybe to kind of compensate for all the comedy i think freaky kind of upped the gore factor a little bit and the slasher factor particularly the opening sequence that isn't my cup of tea either so with that said and i'll stop rambling i promise i'll let you talk um two things here the first is the whole movie is definitely worth it just to see vince vaughn do cheers and other other teenage so typical teenage girl behaviors it's like i i definitely thought it was time well spent for that alone i hope they incorporate yeah. that into the hunt somehow and secondly i do think this is really good material for a haunted house i think there's a potential here for this to be a, a strong showing uh yeah see i and and it's that makes sense. It makes sense. All of your reasoning for why this wasn't for you. I personally, I would say comedy is my favorite thing just in hmm. general. Um, uh, whether it's movies or TV that I want to watch, or uh, if anyone is familiar with my band at all, we definitely are like a very comedy inspired. I would say Conan O'Brien is a bigger influence on me musically in my, what I do with the band <laughs> than any actual musician is. Um, but so like this kind of th- movie I thought was great. I loved, I really liked freaky a lot. Um, it was, I just thought it was fun. I like a more lighthearted feeling even with like, I love horror comedy. Like I feel like it, hmm. it's a, I agree that it's a difficult thing to get right, but when it, when it works, it, I love it so much. And this to me worked. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there's a lot of really good moments in this. I think that there's, um, that like glow in the dark uh putt putt golf (laughs) section of the movie that i think is going to be really fun to see recreated um like certain moments of the movie just scream like oh i can't wait to see how horror nights does this because they really just highlight themselves as like hey you got to see this you got to see this you got to see this um yeah no i agree with that however the last time this happened to me was 2018 I watched the first purge. I really enjoyed it. There were certain sequences where I'm like, oh man, if they if they did end up doing this as a haunted house this year, they could really translate that sequence, they could do that sequence. And when I walked into that haunted house, it didn't really either those sequences weren't there present in the maze, or they just were kind of like a watered down version, like the firecracker. The only one I can remember at this point with my muddled brain is the firecracker alley, the 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 lady is trying to the... yeah with like the dolls hanging down like on right. the strings or whatever that's the only thing i remember too <laughs> yeah so i guess on the one hand it succeeded on the other hand though it just it didn't quite I'm like oh that's it like there's something about it about the execution i you know in all fairness though i will say for both of the horrors of blum house houses that we've gotten before i didn't spend as much time in them as in, as the other houses that those years so um you have to take my my opinion on those with a grain of salt unfortunately you know, it's 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 fine. I mean, everyone's opinion is valid. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I I do like. I haven't had a lot of experience with Michael Landon. I haven't seen the second Happy Death Day. Um, I really liked the first one as well. I liked that movie a lot, and I did listen to an interview that he did talking about the screenplay of that movie and how it's not necessarily that he wanted to make a kind of horror twist on Groundhog Day. The concept actually came from an idea that he had of, would it be possible 
for there to be a slasher movie where you have like the first victim character, which is like a classic trope. And then you've got your final girl. And he wanted to try to write a movie where both of those characters are the same person. And hmm. so the, the solution to that was a kind of Groundhog Day type, um, you know, premise where she goes from being the, you know, the bitch character who dies at the, at the beginning to being the likable, uh, you know, survivor at the end. He's redeemed um, somehow. Yes. And yeah. so that was like this challenge he issued himself in writing of that movie. And uh, it, it's a really great. I think that's so fascinating to me. And uh, I, I don't know that this movie feels like it had the same kind of thought put into it. I think at that point he kind of realized, oh, it's cool to like take this classic movie or this classic trope. And it's never been done as a slasher or as a horror movie before. And so now let's try to do like the horror version of that, um, which I think is also just a fun idea and a fun challenge in its own different way. Yeah, I'll definitely give you that. And I know the writer for Happy Death Day, the first one is credited as Scott Lobdell, who um, I being a teenager in the 90s, I was a huge fan of his X-Men work and other comic work. Um, so I don't, I have to go back now and see like, oh, was, was, did Scott, was he the one who originated that idea or was it, um, was it Christopher Landon and he kind of farmed it out or I, I need to go back and look oh. at that now. That's really interesting. Um, cause I can definitely see that. And I, with the first happy death day, it was a little, it was a little too comedic for my tastes because again, I'm this boring, intense individual, <laughs> but I did really appreciate that there's a character arc. I think so much horror, this is something that, um, some friends of mine, uh, friends of ours, I should say, like Hunter, and I always mm. go back and forth on, I, I feel like so much of horror is just schlock and it's just superficial and there's there's no redeeming quality to it beyond like some visceral scares here and there and that's it. Um, and with Happy Death Day, there was more of a, an emotional heart and more of substance to it. Uh, I w maybe I was kind of expecting that out of Freaky, which, you know, again, to be fair, there is a little bit of character development with uh, the teenage girl and her relationship with her mom and her mom learning to let go, not to get into too many spoilers here. Yeah. So there, there definitely was redeeming quality there too. Yeah. I, I, I kind of agree with you on a lot of horror movies um, about, you know, there not being kind of a lot of substance there. Um, I think I have a lot of hot takes and unpopular opinions on horror movies when it comes to the horror nights community. Um, so I try not to share them too much. Uh, but you know, I love, I love anything in a haunted house, you know, it's a, it's a completely different, uh, experience. And I, I, yeah. I do find the, uh, being a fan of haunt attractions and haunt experiences is to me very separate from being a fan of horror movies, which I don't generally yeah. watch unless they are in preparation for Halloween Horror Nights. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they usually get me too. And then I end up getting suckered into something like American Horror Story in the spinoff oh, show yeah. now. So yeah, it, it's it's funny how it catches up with you. And <laughs> yeah. With Haunted Houses, you're right. It's 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 a different well, it's like riding a theme park attraction, right? It's it's a different experience. You're not looking for redemptive character arcs or other types of emotional bathos. You're looking for that visceral reaction. You're looking for the and more than that, you're looking for the immersion. I definitely think that there is a lot of chance for universal's designers to have an immersive element with like, for just talking to the, about the opening sequence again, there's that mansion and there's Vince Vaughn as a killer wearing that mask. And he kind of does his little homage to Michael Myers, the way he kind of looks, he tilts his head childlike. There's little uh, touches like that in environments and scenic design that you could definitely get into. Yeah. Uh, and black phone, not having read the short story yet and not obviously having seen the film yet. Uh, just look just based upon the iconic mask that we see in the posters and trailers and stuff like that alone is probably what convinced Universal to say, yes, we want that, Mr. Mr. Jason Blum. <laughs> yeah. And now you mentioned something again that um, I didn't actually know until you mentioned it, which is that the black phone is based on a short uh, story. And you said that it was written by Stephen King's son, which I didn't even, I didn't know that either. I didn't know he had a son. I didn't know his son was a writer. I didn't know he oh, wrote yeah. this story, all this stuff. So uh, if we're, are, do you have anything else on, on Freaky um, before we move on? Uh, no, but 
if you were to challenge me to come up with a couple of scenes, maybe if you guys want to do some kind of like a episode right before the event kicks off, like the scenes that you think are most likely or perhaps least likely likely to be included in the IP houses, I'd be happy to kick over some some ideas your way. If I had, I think I have a pick for least likely, which is the touching moment between uh, Millie and her mom in the ch- dressing room, in the uh, <laughs> in the fitting room of the store. And they're just having a nice heart to heart. I wouldn't expect to see that moment in the haunted house. Now, now that you said that, and I agree, that's a, <laughs> it's a challenge now. Like, okay, yeah. where where can Universal sneak it in? Like, uh, maybe as a tag on the way out. You know, <laughs> you kind of look over your shoulder and you see this touching the, the two scare actors having a nice little dramatic moment together, and you're looking yeah. for some kind of like bear to come out. And no, <laughs> it's just that's how they get you. There's no scare at the end. I don't know. <laughs> subverting expectations by having not a stinger scare but a stinger heartwarming moment right it's a whole new uh churn for halloween horror nights which (laughs) you know after doing stuff like uh ghostbusters where it's more of a dark ride supposedly than an actual you know haunted experience maybe this is the next evolution of the event (laughs) we'll just have to wait and see hallmark halloween hallmark nights (laughs) oh well well, maybe we'll let we'll let uh, some other park try to tackle that because I do like <laughs> Horror Nights very much the way it is. Um, but OK, so the black phone and now this is and this is a movie that I uh, hadn't heard a ton about until I just started hearing it rumored for the event and just hearing uh, people talk about how excited they were. And I hadn't heard about it bef- before that. So I, you know, I was out of the loop on it. Just like, well, how are all these people excited about this thing that's not out? <laughs> and from what I, I didn't know it was based on anything. So perhaps that excitement is based on some knowledge of the short story. But what are what are we dealing with here? What is the black phone? What is where does this story come from? So Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. I, again, it, you know, let's back up for one second here. Let's go sure. on a quick little diatribe. Uh, a couple years ago, when I was preparing some articles for a potential Halloween Horror Nights house for Orlando Informer, I ended up watching Creep Show, the TV show version, not the film version, for mm. uh, Shudder. And again, this was not my cup of tea. Hunter made fun of me endlessly for this because it's just so <laughs> campy and silly. And you know. But all those episodes, uh, or most of the episodes, I should say, are based off of short stories or one-shot comic books or stuff of that nature. And I ended up finding each of these short stories and I end up reading them the old like 1980s comic um I just I, I really I fell in love with the source material and that really gave me a better appreciation for horror in print I still I've only really read one Stephen King uh, two Stephen King novels the last was The Shining for when that haunted house came in 2017 to Halloween Horror Nights mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm still slowly kind of getting into Stephen King and also Joe Hill but I can tell you the one major exposure I did have to Joe Hill was the comic book series Lock and Key, which is now a Netflix show that I have not watched. And I hear it's very different. I'm not sure if you have any familiarity with either of those. I've I've heard of it and I've been told that it's good, um, but I have not watched it. OK, I'm curious to see. I need to finish the comics first before I can go and see the translation to television. But right. Uh, it's a really wonderful premise. It, there's just. It's to me, it's like Stranger Things, where it's just enough drama and horror and other elements all stitched together. They kind of like balance each other perfectly. It's it's just it's kind of surreal, which you know gets surreal stuff up my alley. It's right up my alley. I love it. Um, I can tell you, the Black Phone was part of Joe Hill's first short story collection. It came out in two thousand five. It originally was called Twentieth Century Ghosts. The oh, okay. Black Phone is one of them. It's been re-released this year as the Black Phone Stories, I believe. And it said originally released as 20th Century Ghosts, like a little fine print, you know. Oh, I see. The collection was originally released under that title is what you're saying. Right. Okay. I gotcha. So uh, I'm eager to go back. I was I was holding it in my hands the other day. I took my kids to Barnes & Noble. I was holding it in my hands. I'm like, I should probably read this. Ah, I'll read it after the movie comes out. And we'll see if it actually does materialize at Halloween Horror Nights. And then the next day, you know, here it is. I'm kicking myself. I should have gotten it. <laughs> That's what Amazon Prime is for, I guess. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the premise being the the serial killer children. The, I'm sure you've gone over this already with everyone else in their all the lame people who couldn't be here in person and had to send in voice memos and stuff. <laughs> Don't tell them I said lame because you know, they're nice people. Um, <laughs> that's the premise. I'm sure you guys have gone over it. 
The other big thing about Joe Hill that I did not know until I was reading the back of his short story collection is that he wrote a novel called Nosferatu, uh, which is Nos, the letter, f- the number four, A, and then the number two, which is an FX series. I didn't know that was based off of something, and I didn't know it was based off of oh. Joe Hill's something. So I, I feel like this is going to be my next kind of research project, getting into his work more and watching the television and film adaptations of it. Interesting. I think Nos 4A2 was a villain on the Buzz Lightyear of Star Command cartoon. <laughs> it was like a robot <laughs> vampire. It was either Buzz Lightyear or, or it seems like it couldn't have been a Star Wars cartoon. But yeah, Nos 4A2 is... Uh, it's a it's a clever little thing, and I, it makes sense that more than one person has used it. Um, so you have not read the story, but that's a little bit of history about it, is is I guess. Yeah, um, it's been yeah. around for the last seventeen years. It's coming out now as a movie because oh you know, no, two thousand five was does. seventeen years ago. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> hey, uh, I lived if in anyone else two thousand six. <laughs> that's what fifteen years ago. I can't do math. Yeah. I don't know. It's a long time ago. Yeah. It's the, the point is, yes, that's the time's passing. Kenneth, we're both getting older. No, I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, okay. So that's, that's the black phone. I also, of course, have not read it. I didn't know it existed. Um, I am looking forward to the movie though. I, I, the only trailers I've seen were in the theater recently, um, I think maybe before Jurassic World's Dominion, um, there was a it was more of a teaser because it showed us almost nothing about the movie. And then the trailer ended and everyone in the theater went, oh, man, that looks good. And I said, they didn't show us anything. What are you talking about? But I'm, they must have seen other trailers before that. I haven't gone to uh, to look them up or watch them. Um, I'm purposely not. I want to read the short story. I want to see the movie. I want to do the house like in that order. I want to uh, be a, yeah. like an interesting uh, adaptation progression, if you will. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you normally like to read source material before you see a movie or do you like to uh, watch the movie and then go back and read it? So I quit um, writing, freelance writing, uh, editing, all that stuff. I quit it. Oh. Towards the end of last year, I shouldn't say I, it wasn't a deliberate choice. It's something that uh, I, I was offered a new job position uh, that's a completely different from what I've done before. Not completely different, very different from what I've done before. I'm very happy with it. It's it's very rewarding, very challenging. But um, I will tell you a benefit after writing for Screen Rant for so many years and Orlando Informer and all these other places. I don't have to be the most uh, researched, in depth nerd on these things. I can just sit down and watch something. I yeah. don't have to like cram everything in. So like this Halloween Horror Nights, uh, I, I've been anticipating these announcements just like everyone else. I don't, Previously, I would have already have watched and I, I already would have read the short story like three months ago. I already would have had everything prepared and waiting to go. So I, I, I'm kind of just enjoying a more late. Well, it would be laid back if it weren't for a newborn. So there you go. The balance <laughs> of life. Yeah. Okay, so, so now you just watch things you don't necessarily go back and read. What about like if it weren't for work? Um, you know, in general, like, do you have a preference of which way you like to go? Well, I guess I do because, again, I was just talking to my wife about this House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones prequel spinoff. Oh, yeah. Starts in August. Uh, I have a very long lived association with those novels and with the song of ice and fire. It starts with me living in Japan, actually reading them on the train. I had an hour and a half train ride every single day back and forth. Um, and I went through those books. I ended up getting so sick <laughs> of George R. R. Martin, who seems like a very lovely guy. No offense to Mr. Martin. <laughs> um, I got so sick of waiting for those books and everything else that was going on with it that I absolutely just, I found myself refusing to read anything he had done unless it was the next song of ice and fire novel, or it was the next Duncan egg novella, which is the whole, you know, related, but different thing. So I never went back and read all the the histories and the encyclopedias that he had released about the Targaryen dynasty and stuff. Now I find myself like, Oh man, I have all the month of July. I, I, I got to I gotta go out and track these books down. I got to read them all before I can watch the HBO show. So I guess it's just my OCD curse. I have to, <laughs> if I'm interested in the subject before to begin with, I, I need to. Yeah. Read well read. Okay. That's fair. Um, before 
we uh, wrap up because it feels like we are kind of reaching a natural conclusion. I did want to bring up uh, something that you said that you wanted to make sure we got to, which is something related to Scooby-Doo. I don't know how oh, yes. there's a better way that we can segue into it, but... Uh, no segues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, were talk- we were talking about characters at Universal's parks and how uh, they show up or maybe not show up and how they interact with guests. And unfortunately, this did not happen to me. It happened to a dear friend of mine. Um, but he said he and his wife were sitting in the uh, Halloween, the, the horror makeup show. There we go. The horror makeup mm. show. And some lady during one of the little gags with fake blood and everything, she jumped up and she went, ah, and she ran out the theater and she busted open the door into the gift shop and she, the hallway that leads to the gift shop and she left it open and like no one went over to close it because why would you, whatever. A couple minutes later, Scooby-Doo and the gang, they had just finished making the rounds outside in Hollywood on the streets and they were working their way back to backstage. And most of the actors walked by without like, oh, the door's open, you know, stay in character. But then, uh, uh, Shaggy walks by and he stops and he goes, Zoinks, Scoob, what's going on in there? Like he made a big show of looking into the theater and then like Scooby's like, raw, raw, and they, they kind of, you know, quickly ran away. But like, that's the magic that we're talking about theme parks and we're talking about like these experiences and being immersed and it's horrors and um, it's horror and scares when it comes to Halloween Horror Nights. But that's like, that's, that's the essence. Like that's what theme park nerds strive for, right? Like we yeah. live for that. Like the, the rare kind of like getting stuck in Forbidden Journey or something, or being evac'd from uh, Hollywood or Bride Rock. It's, oh, it's these man. things. I guess that's it's a, a dream. <laughs> that is a dream. It's a different kind of immersion than seeing Scooby Doo or whatever kind of cross uh, paths with the horror makeup people. But man, I, I really every, every time I see him in that show, I always think of that and I always laugh and I always go, I wish I could have been there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I remember hearing in, in on some podcast interview with someone who was there for the very early years of Halloween Horror Nights, probably even Fright Nights, um, talking about how in those early years they used to have the Munsters, uh, <laughs> who were I believe meet and greet characters that you could meet in the park, or maybe they were just for Horror Nights. I don't know, but they would have a cast. You know, they would cast actors to be the Munsters. And go out into the park, but they weren't like doing meet and greets or anything like that. They would just go about the event and like be guests, but in character as the Munsters. And that's cool. <laughs> that's the sort of thing that I think nowadays I would want to see Scooby and the gang kind of getting involved and being, you know, trying to solve a mystery or, or, you know, running away from, you know, people with chainsaws in the scare zones. I, I, yeah. And it's a, uh, a legal IP licensing thing that will never right. be possible, but man, what a fun thing that could be. <laughs> yeah. I guess the closest that we get to that kind of sort of, if you close one eye is uh, the who's during uh, Christmas, during Grinchmas at uh, Seuss landing, the who's are supposed to go about like they, they're supposed to have little routines. They talk to each other and they do their thing. And you can like watch them or you can talk to them or take pictures with them or whatever. I don't know how in depth that is anymore. That was the idea way back when. Yeah. And it would be cool to have some kind of extra, almost like a narrative layer at Halloween Horror Nights with that. But, you know, it makes me think about the times when they would have like those private in- invites for like influencers or journalists or like just diehard fans. And for like one night or two nights only at the, towards the end of an event, you would go to like the special kind of interactive haunted house and there's a live actor there and maybe you interact with your phone or maybe there's a VR component or something. Like they, it's kind of a test on Universal's part and it's a reward for the loyal fans. That kind of stuff, like I would love to experience that as well. I just, I think with Horror Nights, unfortunately, it's it's so big and so popular now and there's so many IPs and so many contracts and lawyers involved. I just I don't see Universal having the time or the bandwidth or the, even the desire maybe to do something like that. Yeah, I never was able to do I'm before uh, and uh, listeners to the show know that I did work Horror Nights a, a couple times. Um, and before that, I would never went more than two nights a year um, because, you know, I was in like high school or uh, visiting from college and it didn't make sense to get a you know frequent fear or rush of fear or anything like that. So I'll just go twice. And uh, so those, those things were always towards the end and I would hear about them and just think like that would have been, I, yeah, I can't imagine how cool it would be to get to be part of something like that. I have a friend who actually was 
I don't remember which one he did, but he got to do one of those fan like scavenger hunt type things. Uh, man, how lucky can you get? Only the people luckier are the people who saw Shaggy say zoinks at the horror makeup <laughs> show. <laughs> Whole extra level of immersion, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you for joining us, um, being a guest on Rush of Fear. Uh, if you ever, ever have any other um, topic that you just have all of this information in your head and you just have to put it somewhere. Uh, if it's Horror Nights related, we'd love to have you here. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to try and get together and we can do some kind of sing-along to a certain Super Bowl performer. Just, you know, <laughs> what if, maybe. Yeah, but thank I you for think the invitation. that... I, I it. did hear about that Shakira house uh, possibly right. happening. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if, if people want to follow you anywhere, is there is there somewhere you'd like to direct them on oh, the internet? Uh, as I've said before, I kind of lost all my street cred about a year ago, which is perfectly fine. I'm happy to live in retirement with my uh, retired nerd life with my little newborn. Uh, I do have a Twitter account. It's at msunata, but I tend not to do much there because Twitter's kind of accessible. I do post lots of baby pictures if you're into babies, you know, Halloween baby <laughs> nights uh, at Facebook. If I'm Mark Kleinhans. <laughs> Well, all right. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, This is going to wrap up the episode as a whole. So thank you for listening. Uh, Be sure to follow the show, follow the podcast on your favorite podcast app, rate and uh, review the show. Give us five stars if you, you know, if you like this sort of thing. Uh, You can follow the show on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Rush of Fear Pod. Or send us an email at rushoffearpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can always uh, check out uh, Port Key Vacations. That is Michelle's company. If you'd like to uh, get a quote on that travel agency, you can email michelle at portkeyvacations.com. You can always check out my band Pangolin, uh, found on any music streaming websites that you like or follow us on all social media at pangolin fl so from mark from maddie from michelle and myself i'm i'm gonna be menace today um the podcast has come to an end now get out get out